Professor Likens, it's great to have you here today talking to us as part of this AIDS meeting. I wanted to start by asking you about your background. You work in a field that's not something that uh, every child would know about, stream ecology and carbon balances. How did you get interested in this? I grew up on a small farm in the Midwest, and uh, from as long ago as I can remember, I was interested in uh, things outdoors, um, biology of, of all kinds of critters around, um, and I think that uh, clearly uh, got me started in an interest in, in doing biology in the outdoors. I'm a field biologist. And I'm interested in um, how the, the, the great complexity of, of ecosystems um, works, what makes it function, and how those functions are, are critical to the organisms that live within an ecosystem and to us as humans. What is your training? I was trained as a biologist. Um, my PhD is in zoology, actually, in limnology, um, study of lakes and streams. I worked. Um, on lakes and streams for much of the early part of my career and uh, then have broadened out to uh, a more uh, even larger more complex challenge and that is trying to understand uh, whole landscapes whole watersheds and how those watersheds can be used to understand that complexity of, of the natural ecosystem. Hubbard Brook is one of the most ambitious and important projects in American ecology, I believe. How did that project start? Well, Hubbard Brook was uh, something that we started in 1963, and we started it with a very simple idea. Um, the idea, uh, you have all this complexity out there. It's an enormously complex system. And how can you simplify it in order to try to understand it better? And so the simple idea was, can we use the chemistry of stream water draining a, a watershed ecosystem in much of the same way that a physician would use the chemistry of blood or urine to diagnose the health of a patient, we wanted to know if we could diagnose the health of a forest watershed in the same kind of way. And so we started with that very simple analogy. It worked. It gave us uh, very quickly insights about how the system as a whole was functioning. And then we could delve very quickly into the system and look at specific functions and try to understand them better uh, and, and therefore the whole system better. So um, I'm really enamored with the idea of looking at large complex systems uh, and Hoverbrook is a wonderful example. Of course your claim to fame is uh, having identified acid rain and acidification in the northeast of the United States. The first reports of that from North America. How did that come about? Well, the story of acid rain is very interesting to me. It's, it's not an unusual story in that from the very first samples of rain and snow that we collected as a part of our Hubbard Brook whole ecosystem study, we knew that the rain and snow was very acid, but we didn't know if it was an unusual or not. And so from about 1962 until about 1969, we were collecting uh, rain and snow chemistry and saying, oh, isn't this interesting? I wonder what this means. And it wasn't until I changed jobs and moved from being a professor at Dartmouth College to a professor at Cornell and set up a series of collecting stations around the Finger Lakes in central New York that uh, we discovered this was a, a, a more regional problem. And that was our first clue that this really was something unusual, something different. And so we published the first paper on acid rain in 1972, almost 10 years after those first samples were collected. A lot happened in the meantime to help us understand what was going on. But there was that long delay before we could understand whether this was really unusual or not and what significance it might have ecologically. That, uh, throw in a plug, is one of the really good examples of the value of long-term data. If you collect samples for even a few years, even five years, you sometimes get a misleading idea of what really is going on. Uh, and so a longer time frame is very helpful, and it certainly was in the acid rain issue. Your field depends a lot upon instrumentation and new ways of measuring uh, 
that means that it's a very technologically driven field. What have been the major stepping points over the last hundred years as you helped to develop this field? Well, there, there have been a number of new tools that have helped to open, if you will, that black box of the ecosystem, the way we first started to think about ecosystems. And those tools are, have been of many kinds. Uh, they've been uh, tools of, of doing things, such as being able to experiment with whole systems. That was uh, very powerful in terms of opening up the black box and trying to understand what was going on inside but also tools like radioactive uh, isotopes, stable isotopes, uh, modeling, uh, large data sets. A number of those tools were enormously important, have been, still are, will be enormously uh, um, useful in opening up that complexity of, of the ecosystem black box. What are the trends for the future? Well, in order to make really uh, major advances in the future, we're going to have to um, unravel that complexity. I've been talking about complexity. And rather than avoiding it or ignoring it, um, the real secret, in my opinion, is to try to develop ways of simplifying that complexity so that it can be studied, so that it can, can be understood. But the complexity of um, large systems, uh, and particularly with humans involved in those large systems, is an, is an enormous challenge for the future. Uh, there are many others. I think one of the, uh, the things that concerns me a great deal is that as we go to these larger and larger multidisciplinary efforts, uh, and the National Science Foundation has now started several efforts along that line, we need teams, multidisciplinary teams of people to do uh, that work. And we've given relatively little thought as ecologists to how to structure those teams, how to uh, train the team members so that we can truly develop an interdisciplinary team rather than a multidisciplinary team. An inter interdisciplinary team is one that works on the the boundaries of all the disciplines that are involved rather than just having each person do their own thing. So I think that's a huge challenge for the future. I think it's quite solvable, but we haven't given that enough effort. In your current title and position, you guide a large team. Mm -hmm. You're still experimenting in the Hubbard work area, or where are you working now? Yeah, the Institute of Ecosystem Studies that I direct is um, a group of, of scientists that uh, not only are very bright, but they enjoy working together. And they have uh, developed several large um, team-oriented projects, ranging from efforts towards savannization of the Negev Desert in Israel to uh, large studies of the Hudson River ecosystem to a major new effort, um, which uh, we lead as part of the Baltimore Ecosystem Study, a study of the whole Baltimore area as an ecosystem. And these are large team efforts. They involve um, the scientists working together, sharing information, and, uh, and, and the old saying, we try to make the, uh, uh, the whole more than the sum of its parts. What are you finding out about our environment now? Well, things are changing dramatically. Ecosystems are being buffeted from all kinds of, of insults that we humans uh, throw at them. And um, they clearly are efforts that we will have to, um, to deal with in the future. So as we, as professional ecologists, gain uh, more knowledge and better understanding, then we can apply that understanding toward solutions, helping to guide solutions for um, managers, decision makers, and others. But the problems are, are very large, including the one uh, that gets probably the most headlines these days is uh, global climate change, but loss of species, invasion of exotic species, or, or now it's referred to alien species, uh, land use changes, uh, toxification or pollution of the biosphere. These are still major, major problems. And they're occurring at such large scales uh, that it requires a large scale effort and a multidisciplinary team effort in order to make understanding. We have to, um, we have to also add, uh, which we've not done very well in the past, social scientists, economists, um, um, historians, um, people. 
into this equation if we're going to make real progress, in my opinion. Can you get this message out to people? We try to get the message out to people at every opportunity. I guess that's why I'm speaking to you, but <laughs> um, it's difficult. It's difficult because there are other factors in that equation. Um, there are economic considerations or political considerations, um, all of which I would argue are tied intimately into uh, an analysis of an ecosystem and how it functions and how it changes. Uh, but people have different perceptions of what they think are important. And some of that may be a lack of understanding of what truly is important from a biological point of view or from a sustainability point of view, that is, to, to um, protect an environment or protect a way of life into the future. Um, so those are tough challenges of what I would just call general ecological literacy that uh, we have to meet and we have to succeed with. What does science have to do to meet these challenges in the future? Well, we as scientists, I think, um, we, we try to develop new knowledge. We try to develop a better understanding. Um, that's only one part of the equation, but it's an important part of the equation in terms of making intelligent decisions. And so I think it's um, very important for scientists to be able to um, make that information known to uh, the public and to policymakers. I'm fond of a phrase that we use at the Institute of Ecosystem Studies, and that is that we not only collect data, but we want to be able to, to translate it and transmit it to the public. I mean, only a part of our job is done if we just collect the data. We have to make it available and understandable to decision makers and to the public. Do you see a greater integration of sciences in the future? Well, from my point of view, if we're going to um, use multidisciplinary teams and strive toward this interdisciplinary um, understanding that I think is very important, then the only way that that's going to happen, it seems to me, is if we are able to bring um, those, those disciplines, those people who are doing those disciplinary kind of efforts together in an integrated way, but even more important is the integrated results, the integrated management that uh, we would like to achieve. Do you like the truck in the background? Yeah, I had to raise just to say we have to do that one. I couldn't hide that one. I'm going to need to go. What's acid rain and acidification? That was one of my better ones. Yes, it was. Did you lose it? Only the end. Okay. <laughs> What's acidification in acid rain like now in your region? Well, one of, the, one of the really interesting components of acid rain is that after we passed the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments, I think uh, the public and the politicians just kind of took a giant sigh of relief. Phew, that problem is finished. It's not finished at all. We still have acid rain. Uh, it's a major continuing environmental problem. It has uh, continued to acidify lakes and streams. It has leached. Uh, important nutrients out of forest soils and on and on and on. So we have a we have a way to go, and this is this is um, an important and complicated problem because since we we collectively made that sigh of relief, um, it's going to be very hard now to turn the public back into saying, oh, "What we have to do more?" Well, we do uh, from a science perspective. We know we have to do more, but I think it's going to be a very difficult task to convince the public that. Well, why didn't we do it in the first place? I can't give an answer to that. That was a political decision. But I can tell you that the acid rain problem has not been solved. I want to thank you for talking with us today because your research has really had an impact at least on policy and some of the way that we live our lives in North America today. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you.